Yo, what's happening guys? It's GM Cody and welcome back to another video. Um, as promised last week, we are not doing a game overview this week. We are not looking at a game supplement. We are talking about a topic. <laughs> we have a topical discussion this week. And uh, it's kind of feeding off of last week's discussion uh, where I was doing an overview of Dave Varnison's first fantasy campaign. I wanted to, it, it got me thinking all week about um, Dave Arneson's first fantasy campaign, and specifically not the supplement, but what that campaign was and what it was all about, and the, specifically the rules that Dave Arneson used for the original Blackmore campaign and campaigns. Uh, this is something I've been interested in for a very long time. Uh, obviously, if you haven't gathered by now from being on this channel, or you know, if you know me personally, I'm a big fan of the history of role-playing games. And so, you know, I do, I've done research on this stuff for years, and I eat up anything I can about the history of the game, uh, you know, Dungeons and Dragons specifically, because it's the first one. Uh, but we're going back further than Dungeons and Dragons here. We're going to proto Dungeons and Dragons, if you will. And that's Dave Arneson's Blackmore campaign. So, yeah, let's see how this goes. <laughs> so, uh, the one thing to note before we get started here is. A lot of this uh, information I'm, I'm about to discuss with you guys and talk about is a lot of it is speculative, all right? And one reason for that is, unfortunately, Dave was very close to the chest about w what his rules were that he used uh, for his Blackmore games. He kept everything very close to the chest. He did write things down, it seems, but they were kind of just notes and mad scribblings here and there. He didn't really have like a uh, cohesive rule book, per se, it seems, from what I can gather. Um, maybe he does somewhere, and we just, you know, it's it's lost somewhere at a time or whatever, but it seems like everything was just here in his head. And from, you know, Dave himself said that's pretty much how it was, and all his players in the Blackmore group pretty much said the same thing. You know, that Dave just kind of uh, made the rules up as he went, and they just evolved over the years and changed a lot. Uh, but, you know, all the players were very unclear what all the rules actually were to do anything, for the most part. They, they had an idea of some things, but for the most part, they really didn't know how everything worked. Dave uh, would just tell them to make rolls, or, you know, the players would tell Dave what they wanted to do, and Dave, in turn, would tell the players what to roll. And apparently, he kept that philosophy up until the day he died, even when he was running games at conventions and stuff. Uh, people I know that have played with Dave said the same thing, you know, like, you know, they might have a character sheet, generally didn't. And, uh, you know, Dave just asked, what do you want to do? And here's the roles you make. Uh, so, needless to say, a lot of this stuff, this information is speculative. And some of it is well known and documented. Uh, but it's still speculative about a, what a lot of it means. Uh, I will say also that I don't have all the information. I'm not a scholar. I'm not a, you know... A role-playing game historian. Uh, I guess I'm. I guess you consider me an amateur role-playing game historian. But you know, I'm no uh, uh, John Peterson or whoever that guy is that wrote. You know, uh, that great book, uh, "Playing at the World," which is a great book. You should check it out. Or any of those guys. You know, like I don't know as I, I don't know as much as those guys do. But I do know a bit about it. And I've been doing some research over the week uh, to kind of refresh myself. Uh, to talk about this subject because I think it's very interesting and hopefully you guys do too. So right off the bat, let's start, uh, you know, where did the Blackmore campaign start? So it started with the Twin Cities group that Dave Arneson was playing with. Uh, I, I will say first before, you know, I start launching into this, a really good source of information. If you want to know more about the, uh, you know, the Blackmore campaign and Dave Arneson and, you know, the origins of the hobby, really, role-playing game hobby, uh, go watch Secrets of Blackmore, and I'll put a link below. Uh, I watched, I've watched that thing at least like ten times. I love it. It's one of my favorite documentaries now. Um, I highly recommend it. Well worth the cost of entry. Very good, very you know, very well put together film. So go check that out for sure. Uh, again, I'll put links below. Another good source, excuse me, of information is going to be a blog actually, and it's called Hidden in Shadows. Uh, again, I will put the link below. 
It is a very good source of information. The gentleman there, I don't know his name. I'm sure he mentions it on his blog. Uh, has, you know, become very obsessed with the subject of Dave Arneson's original Blackmore campaign and pretty much has taken all the information he can and compiled it on this blog and goes into really, you know, really, really in-depth territory as to uh, Dave Arneson's original, you know, systems he used and comparing them to Dungeons and & Dragons and all sorts of stuff. It's really good stuff. If you're interested in that sort of thing and want more details, I would recommend those two sources. But anyways, so Dave Artisan's campaign originally started, it seems, in 1970. Now, uh, there's there's some debate about this because some of the players say that they didn't uh, actually play in a, a, black, a proper Blackmore game until 1971. But needless to say, we have some hard evidence that suggests it was in 1970. Uh, and that evidence was he basically posted in his... Uh, weekly or in his whatever monthly newsletter or whatever uh, for his wargaming club that he'd be running a fantasy Bronstein which if you don't know what a Bronstein is Bronstein was a game that was played by Dave Wesley and Dave Wesley was part of the Twin Cities group as well and essentially Bronstein uh, a, a lot of people consider actually to be the first role-playing experience and what it was was a uh, Dave Wesley was away for a while and you know Dave Wesley was kind of the head of that one of the head honchos of that Twin Cities group and uh, he went away to college and you know Dave Arneson kind of started taking charge a little bit more and whatnot um, but Dave Wesley was in college he came back for some you know um, some holiday break and he had the idea to do this uh, experimental Napoleonics game and it, he called it Bronstein. He didn't tell anybody what he was doing. He invited everybody other over, had Napoleonic set up on his table, and then he started passing out, you know, notes. And on these notes were characters. And this is the character you were playing for the night, and you had a mission to achieve. And so basically what it, devo you know, the players thought they were going to play a Napoleonic's battle. And it actually was a role-playing game. You know, so one player was the head of the militia and one player was, you know, the mayor or whatever of the town. And one player was a university student. They all had their different goals. And uh, eventually it was, I think originally Dave Wesley uh, intended for all this to culminate into an actual like Napoleonics battle at the end of all the, you know, talking and stuff. He didn't realize that uh, it would devolve into the experience it did. And what happened is... He was initially taking players one at a time by themselves in a, se a separate room and telling them what happens, and they told him what they want to do, and he'd send them back. But as he, all, all these players were waiting, and he got he had a lot more players than he uh, thought he was going to have, you know. So he had to make up roles for people. In between all this, players started uh, talking amongst themselves and making dealings with themselves, and then before you know it, they were role playing. You know, and they had already been doing this in previous war games campaigns, but this was like a new evolution of that. And so, um, you know, Dave Wes at the end of the night, basically, Dave Wesley considered it a failure, but all the players loved it. And so, there were many other Bronsteins that were played thereafter. Now, you can find lots of information about the Bronstein games, and they are definitely, um, in my opinion, the the genesis point of where the concept of role playing came from, and it's affirmed in this newsletter that you know uh, Dave Arneson posted in 1970 uh, saying that he was going to run a fantasy Bronstein at his house so needless to say whether it was 1970 or 71 uh, some players came over and they played in the first uh, Blackmore game now there's some debate what that actual first game what took place in that first game uh, it seems that some players or misremembering things and think they played in the first game but didn't actually play in the first game they might have played in the second or third or whatever game and just were not aware of it but you know that so we don't really know what happened in the first game from what I understand there's many different takes on what happened in that game but essentially what it devolved into was um, you know what became known as the Blackmore games and the Blackmore games took place in the town of Blackmore uh, Castle Blackmore and of course there was uh, a dungeon, you know, the dungeons underneath Blackmore. And this was the whole concept of, 
you know, Dungeons and Dragons and role playing began. Uh, so, you know, the rules they were using is what we're really discussing tonight. So the rules seem to, it's, it's pretty interesting when you look at the rules, uh, the fragments of rules we have from Blackmore. So first off, there is some debate whether uh, or not initially Dave Arneson was using chainmail, which if you don't know what chainmail is, which I think most of you guys do, it was a uh, medieval war games developed by none other than Gary Gygax and Jeff Perrin uh, from Lake Geneva. And it was a very popular rule set at the time, and a lot of the wargaming groups around that area were using it heavily. Um, so there has always been speculation that Dave Arneson, you know, used that as the basis for his uh, Blackmore game. And no doubt he he definitely did. He admits that he he did use it. But it appar apparently, uh, you know, some people think, you know, whole cloth just used chain mail. I don't think that was the case. And it appears that, that certainly wasn't the case from the early character sheets and stuff we've seen now. But he was definitely using it as a reference and definitely taking ideas from it. Uh, so the original Blackmore character, what would a character look for, look like? Well, you did have ability scores, uh, for sure. Now these have cha these changed because, like I said, Dave Arneson's games evolved uh, drastically over over time. Uh, so we don't, you know, they the, even the you know the attributes would change over time. Now he called these personality scores instead of attributes, and they were somewhere some these were probably around, you know, the original somewhere close to what the original ones would have been. So these are uh, brains, looks, credibility, sex, health, strength, courage, cunning, and loyalty. So uh, a lot more ability scores than you would have in Dungeons and Dragons. Now, again, these changed and altered through the years, and some players had less than others. Uh, another thing to note is, you know, the Blackmore game was definitely a skill-based game which is really interesting uh when you hear a lot of the people you know in the old school D, &D movement and the osr movement talk uh down to skill-based games when in fact the original origin point of dungeons and dragons the blackmore game was a skill-based game now it seems that you know when dave arneson brought this to lake geneva that system was quickly dropped for whatever reason i'm not sure and of course in the original Dungeons and Dragons, we don't really have skills. We have, we do have skill-like things in original Dungeons and Dragons, but we don't have a skill system as such. But in Blackmore, you actually did have skills. Uh, so it is uh, definitely a debate to how many skills were available, but these were definitely in the game. So here's the skills that were on some of the original character sheets. Uh, horsemanship, woodsmanship, Leadership, flying, seamanship, throwing, and miscellaneous. So miscellaneous, I think all the other ones are pretty self-explanatory. And miscellaneous was basically supposed to be uh, like the catch-all for any other skill that wasn't uh, listed there. So those were all the basic skills. And you have weapon skills, which were much more um, varied and broad. And, you know, this is a huge list, so I'm not going to go through it, but basically list every type of weapon. You had daggers and hand axes and maces and swords and halberds and even uh, stuff like siege weapons, like catapults and bombards, which is really, really fascinating. Uh, another thing to note is the, the numbers were actually, uh, you know, went were it, everything was based on a 2D6 system, and it appears all the numbers for attributes and skills uh, fell in line with that as well. So either, I guess, they rolled 2d6 for attributes, even though I've read some sources saying that they rolled uh, a different, you know, different type of dice. But it seems that, you know, uh, the skills and personality traits ran from uh, scores of 2 to 12, or maybe 3 to 12. We're not really sure. Uh, but either way, it seems that you would roll 2d6 and try to roll under your skill to be successful. And that's, that's how you made skill checks, uh, which is actually a pretty cool and elegant system. Now, initially, so combat, let's talk about combat. So in the original Blackmore campaign, it's very apparent that, uh, you know, chainmail was being used uh, initially. The man-to-man -man combat system, 
uh, was definitely being used by Dave, as was the, you know, uh, attacks versus fantastical creatures was being used. Now, apparently, they didn't use hit points in the original um, Blackmore games, which is very interesting. Uh, and a lot of the players said, you know, you, you would take a hit and you would die. And after a time, it's unsure exactly when, but after a time, a lot of the players, you know, approach Dave about, well, can we take some more hits before we just die after one hit? And uh, Dave quickly, you know, uh, soon after, you know, uh, adapted hit point system, and it seems that he might have adapted the uh, the amount of hits, hit points that you see in chainmail, uh, and the levels and stuff in there as well. You know, like the hero and superhero and whatnot. Um, and I should have brought up chainmail as a reference and whatever, but you know they have level titles in chainmail, and they you know those level you know those levels of heroes can take a certain amount of hits. And that's where the concept of hit points came from. Uh, and it appears Dave was using something like that. And he was definitely using levels, for sure. You definitely leveled up. Now, what exactly levels did for you is fairly unclear, but it, it appears that you got more powerful. So maybe your skills went up. Uh, you definitely probably got more hit points and whatnot. Uh, armor. Armor's really interesting. So, like I said, originally... Uh, we think that Dave was using, you know, the chainmail system for armor class, and then he quickly switched to another system. Apparently, he he says from his own quotes, based off of his uh, his naval ironclads game that he wrote. Now he wrote a couple uh, naval rule sets, and uh, in that set was the concept of uh, armor class. This is where the you know the term came from. Now, I think he just called it armor in Blackmore. And it was apparently a rating from, uh, you had four classes of armor, and I think it was rated from one to six, depending if you had a shield or not. Now, uh, it worked a little bit differently. You didn't roll to hit versus the armor class. You rolled to hit versus your skill rating. If you succeeded, you hit, and then you would roll, and then you would roll to penetrate the armor of, um, of the character or monster or what, whatnot. Uh, and that armor penetration was, ba it appears to have been a d6 roll, and you were trying to beat the armor class of whatever the character's armor was to penetrate their armor, which I think is a really cool idea, actually. So it's almost, it's basically an armor save, essentially, which is a very old school uh, wargaming thing. And, and of course, you know, Dave was taking these concepts from war games. Um, definitely Chainmail, but also the games that the, you know, the Twin City gamers were using, like Strategos. You can see a lot of similarities between the games of Strategos, uh, the, the variant that they were playing, the Bronstein games they were playing. You can see all that uh, in the evolution of Dave's game. So apparently that's how armor worked uh, in for the longest time in um, Blackmore. And I think it's a really interesting armor class system actually it's an armor class system i've always toyed around with i don't i've never actually seen a game use armor a role-playing game that uses armor saves and i always thought that it, you know that idea was really intriguing in war gaming i thought it made a lot of sense too and uh always thought it would work really well for a role-playing game so apparently uh, you know dave already thought these things back in you know the early 70s but i digress it's here, I if you if you've guys seen a role playing game that uses armor saves, let me know because that that concept is always intrigued me. Uh, needless to say, here you know like the skills and the armor saves and stuff. You know, Dave was definitely ahead of the curve in everything here, and actually, uh, you know, like so far, like what what we've talked about with the the Blackmore system. This sounds like a really cool fucking game. <laughs> you know, it's too bad this never got published because I'd almost rather play this than you know original Dungeons and Dragons. Don't get me wrong, I love original D and D, but this is all this these concepts that Dave originally had sound really awesome to me. So let's get back uh, to some of the other rules concepts. Uh, another one would be magic, right? How did magic work in Blackmore? Well, Dave does give us some uh, hard clues to how magic worked in the first fantasy campaign. You can read the first fantasy campaign, and he does talk about a few things in there, uh, a few hints and clues, 
and uh, just straight up remarks about how things worked in you know the original Blackmore games, and it's very clear that a magic magic originally worked with the concept that it was consumable. Uh, there were only two classes apparently in the original Blackmore games. You could be a fighting man or you could be a magic user, and uh, so only a magic user could use spells. You might have only known a certain number of spells. It seems that that was uh, the, probably the case. And probably had spell books, maybe. Uh, but magic was used through consumables. You had to, use, you had to uh, consume, uh, apparently, some kind of like super berries and all, ki all kinds of weird things uh, in order to cast spells. Which is very much like the video game's uh, Ultima, actually, which is really cool. In Ultima, you had to gather together all these components and ingredients uh, in order to cast a spell, even if you knew the spell. Uh, so it wasn't a, a Vancean style of magic that we'd see in, you know, Dungeons and Dragons later on. Though the components thing, la you know, was definitely went on into, you know, it, I don't think it was an original, it wasn't an original Dungeons and Dragons for the most part, but it was an advanced Dungeons and Dragons. So apparently that concept was, you know, definitely still floating around in the ether in the, uh, in Gary Gygax's mind. Um, but I think Gygax definitely came up, you know, uh, with the Vancian magic system. Uh, but the consumable magic system is intriguing, definitely. Uh, but it appears that that wasn't the, you know, uh, the f of course, not the final say the way magic worked in Blackmore. Like I said, Dave changed and evolved this game over the years. And a Apparently, they moved to more, very quickly, within the first couple of years, they moved to a uh, magic point system. Uh, again, it's unclear how all that worked, and some people say that, you know, you could just cast whatever kind of spells. Or some people say you actually had to learn different types of spells. So it might have just worked differently in every campaign that Dave was running. Who knows? And that seems very likely to me. That, you know, like I said, Dave seemed to just change things all the time. Uh, whatever he felt like at the time. And, you know, whatever he said went. So, you know, things changed. So it, it doesn't surprise me that there's so much conflicting information uh, to the rules of Blackmore. But regardless, we get an idea of, you know, how these things work. And that's an idea how the magic system worked. Uh, so what else can we talk about the original Blackmore rule set? Well, we do know uh, what classes were in Blackmore. So, like I said originally, there was the um, just the fighting man and the magic user. But uh, Tim Cask actually gave us some clues. And, of course, the original Blackmore players. But Tim Cask was actually the biggest point of information for this. For when Dave Arneson submitted his notes for Supplement 2 of the original Dungeons & Dragons Blackmore, he had a list of classes that were in the original Blackmore campaign. And these were Fighting Man, Cleric, uh, Magic User, Ranger, Paladin, Assassin, Merchant, and Sage. So there you go. Those were, you know, the cla up until, you know, 1973 or, se or 74 or whatever. Uh, those were the classes that were available to you if you were playing in Dave's Blackmore campaign, of course. This, uh, you know, obviously expanded and shrunk as time went on. And, uh, you know, so. Now, what were different about these classes? Well, uh, we know what a fighting man is, and we know what a magic user is. The cleric is kind of interesting. <coughs> All right, sorry. Had to attend to something for the wife. So, uh, where was I? Talking about clerics. So, clerics were a little bit different in... Uh, Blackmore as compared to original Dungeons and Dragons. So it's unclear exactly how they worked. Uh, what is clear is they could use magic, they could turn undead, uh, but they also had to tithe, you know, some of their um, wealth and stuff, much like, you know, what we see in the Paladin in D&D. Uh, &D. Uh, so we don't know if they had, to, it's clear that they probably did use components does, doesn't appear that and uh, they could just cast in the early days at least between 71 or 70 and 73 uh, they could just cast spells all the time I guess as long as they made their rolls and Dave said yeah you could cast spells uh, they definitely had healing spells and healing abilities uh, so they were fairly similar to the clerics we'd see in D&D &D. 
Now, some of these other classes uh, we're not so sure on. You know, I'm assuming they're probably very similar to what we saw later in later iterations of Dungeons and Dragons. You know, such as the Ranger, um, probably very similar, and same with the Paladin. I assume just a mix of fighting man and cleric. Assassin is probably very much uh, in line with the, you know, um, OD&D counterpart, uh, because that was a creation of, you know, that was an insertion into D&D from Dave Arneson directly in Supplement 2. And the Merchant and Sage, of course, is completely missing from D&D, and that's something Dave wanted to put in D&D, and Tim Kask, who was the editor-in-chief at the time at TSR, and apparently was responsible for basically cobbling together Dave's notes in the supplement too, uh, just did not include those because he didn't feel like they were appropriate character classes, uh, which is, I mean, acceptable. I mean, I understand why Tim did think, you know, Merchant and Sage was an appropriate character class, but apparently people did play these characters. So uh, it's kind of interesting that people were playing Merchants and Sages and such, and maybe there were others too. They were playing, you know, non, non-adventuring uh, kind of character types. Uh, so that's something that was really different in the Blackmore campaigns. Uh, needless to say, I don't really have uh, too much more to talk about with the Blackmore rules. I just wanted to, uh, I just felt the need to talk about this. I found, I found it and find it really interesting, and I thought you guys would too. Hey, let me know uh, in the comments below if you have any more information, you know, about uh, the early rules. Dave's early rules on the Blackmore campaign. I'm very, very eager and interested to learn more. Uh, let me know if I was wrong about something. Uh, you know, the one thing I'll say, and I said it over and over, a lot of this is speculation. So there's a lot of rumors and things flying around on the internet, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's true. I found that out pretty quick. Uh, but there are some things that are true, and I tried to stick to, you know, factual information where I could and made sure to tell you that, you know, the information I wasn't so sure on is uh, speculative. So, but if you have any more information, please let me know or any other good sources. Of course, I'm going to link, uh, you know, couple a couple of my sources. I have some more, but a couple of really good sources. If you're interested in learning more about Dave's Blackmore campaign, definitely go check them out in the comments below. And I want to also say I hope you guys have a good Thanksgiving and a good holiday. I'm also going to be releasing a second video uh, tonight. A follow-up on my uh, tabletop simulator demo uh, talking about um, I glossed over some things last night and I want to address them so I'm gonna be making a part two to that tonight so you guys are getting two videos this week maybe three if you if you count the one from uh, last night Sunday so anyways I hope you guys have a good one we'll check you guys last time y'all take care peace <laughs>